Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Uh, I hope you're all uh, doing well and finding ways to cope with the continuing situation. Uh, a bit of good news this morning. Uh, the last lecture for uh, the semester is going to be on computer-designed or computer-evolved organisms, otherwise known by their nickname, uh, xenobots. I mentioned uh, our work on xenobots at the beginning of the semester, and we were very excited to see uh, xenobots uh, in print, or at least online, on the New York Times uh, on Friday. Uh, I heard that uh, Xenobots are also in the physical New York Times uh, this morning, but it turns out it's uh, not an easy thing to get a physical New York Times uh, under a house arrest in uh, Jericho, Vermont. So I was hoping to show you a screenshot of uh, evolved robots made out of cells in the New York Times today, but at least uh, you can see it online. So uh, go and have a read through the article and we'll talk more about the technical details uh, of Xenobots at the end of the semester. Okay, so uh, back to lecture, uh, just to make sure that you can all hear me, everyone can hear me okay, please type into chat uh, if you can. Uh, I made an error in recording uh, the lecture last uh, Thursday. Good, you can hear me. Okay, so uh, I made an error uh, recording last Thursday's lecture. I apologize, the uh, audio cut out partway through, uh, so I canceled the uh, quiz for last time. Uh, however, uh, if you didn't uh, attend the lecture, you can go and find. Um, if you go up to the, uh, you go up to the top of the schedule. You can see the lecture series, video lecture series from last year. And you can find the lecture uh, about the dot bot if you're interested for the details and go and watch last year's lecture about uh, the dot bot. Okay, uh, just a, just a moment about uh, just a. Uh, housekeeping notes about uh, the weekly reports. So uh, graduate students, you're starting in on your eighth and final weekly report uh, this week, which is due as usual next Monday evening. And you'll then have the, uh, the remaining of the semester to work uh, on the finishing touches on your final project, uh, at which time you'll present things orally and we will talk about how all that's gonna work as we get closer to uh, May 4th. Undergraduates, you're moving on with uh, weekly report three. Um, if anybody has any questions about how to do things in PyroSim, please type them into chat and I can try and answer them uh, before we get too deep into lecture uh, this morning. Okay, so um, let's carry on. Uh, we're working our way through a short uh, three-part lecture on collective robotics. So there are a lot of uh, dangerous, dull, dirty, or distant jobs out there, the four Ds that we might want robots to do because humans can't do them or don't want to do them. Some of those jobs uh, may be difficult for any one large complex robot to do. A better approach might be to design a large number of small and simple machines that can collectively perform uh, that task. And we started by looking at that last time. And as usual, uh, we started with uh, our inspiration in nature. We looked at flocking uh, and swarming in uh, animal species. We then looked uh, in the 19, at the, some work from the 1980s in computer graphics about the Boyd's uh, algorithm. And the basic idea of the Boyd's algorithm, which we won't go through again now, is that you have exactly the same control program running on each Boyd, but depending on the particular position and orientation of a Boyd relative to its neighbors, it can produce different behavior. So even though you have a swarm of animals or uh, machines, they might all be running exactly the same program, but individually give rise to different behavior, but collectively we get some desired behavior like swarming. Okay, we moved on to uh, looking at virtual lions and gazelles moving about on a virtual uh, Serengeti plain. We have one gazelle and four lions. Um, and we're going to continue to explore, uh, explore this idea using this cartoon of this two-dimensional plane. But just uh, to remind yourself, if you imagine this rectangle as a piece of paper, you roll up that paper so that the two long edges are touching one another, and then bend that cylinder so the two short edges are touching one another. You have a donut or a toroid, and on a toroid there are no edges. One can continually moving in the same direction indefinitely uh, and never meet uh, an edge. 
So just keep that in mind as we continue on. There was some confusion about this last time, so I think it might be worthwhile sort of going over this idea uh, of the toroidal plane before we uh, dive back into the details of the lions and gazelles. So one way you can think about this is if we imagine our we imagine our two-dimensional Serengeti plane, uh, and we have, uh, I'll just do one lion and one gazelle. We can ask how close the lion is to the gazelle or vice versa. Remember that this is a toroid, so one way to visualize this is to imagine exactly the same plane tiled with eight identical planes uh, around it. And I won't draw this, or I'm gonna end up drawing on my own wall here. And we then imagine that we take exactly the same uh, lion and gazelle and put them at the same positions in these neighboring identical planes. And if we do so, you can see that in the center, pl in the center plane, it looks like the lion is relatively far uh, from the gazelle. Let's move these down a little bit. Lion and gazelle, lion and gazelle. And although it might look in the center plane that the lion is quite far from the gazelle, you can see that the lion is actually close to the gazelle uh, if we imagine this as, as the toroid. So this is basically the unrolled uh, toroid. And so this is just something to keep in mind about uh, the neighborhood uh, when we calculate distances between lions and gazelles. And a lot of the work we're gonna see uh, in a moment we're gonna be computing the shortest distance between a lion and a gazelle and vice versa. It's the shortest distance on the toroid, not the shortest distance inside uh, this circumscribed 2D plane. Hopefully that, that helps. Okay. Uh, and just a reminder that we are going to fix the behavior of the gazelle by hand. We're going to design the, the behavior of the gazelle by hand and evolve behavior for the four uh, lions. We just talked about this. Uh, the, just to remind you, the behavior of the gazelle is going to be a weighted sum of the four vectors that connect the gazelle to the lion along the closest edges. Remember that point. And we're going to weight these uh, vectors by how close the lion is to the gazelle. And the gazelle is then going to move in the opposite direction, where the direction is the summed vectors weighted by the closest uh, lion. OK. All right, so how are we going to evolve the behavior of the lions? Well, we're going to do so using genetic programming, which we've seen a few times now uh, in this course. And that genetic programming is a particular type of evolutionary algorithm where the genotype or the genetic instructions are encoded in a particular data type, which is a tree. All of the GP trees that we've seen so far act on numbers. The GP trees that we're going to be evolving for our lions are operations acting on a vector. So we ended last time by thinking about some hypothetical, thinking about some hypothetical, let's see if I can keep both of these on the screen at the same time. I think that's good enough. Okay, uh, we're going to we're going to um, we're going to draw some hypothetical trees and imagine how the uh, how the lion would move in that case. So let's imagine that we have our four lions and each of them are running. Uh, I'll just write L for last. So you can see that one of the three uh, vector variables that we have is last, meaning the direction that the lion went in the last direction. If we take this tree and down make four copies of, those, of that tree and drop one copy of the tree into each of the four lions, each of the four lions, when we drop them in uh, on, the, on the toroid with the gazelle, are placed at random positions and at the first time step of the simulation they move in random directions so we're going to have four lions that then move uh, uh, are going to move in the direction they moved last imagine a second tree and I'm going to put R for random so this tree is going to return out of the top a vector, which is the sum of the two vectors L and R, last and random. So how is this, if we take this tree 
and copy it four times into the four lions and drop that pride of lions onto the toroid. How are those four lions going to behave on the toroid? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Exactly. So we're going to get lines that are still moving randomly, uh, or that are moving randomly, but more or less in the direction they moved previously. So is that a better is that a better better hunting strategy than just moving in a straight line according to the random direction you headed at the first time step of the simulation? Uh, hard hard to say. So you can imagine constructing ever more complex trees that are built up of uh, vector operations. Um, and you can see that some of these vector operations are relatively complex. For example, the if dot down here. If dot requires four arguments. And these arguments themselves might be trees made up of vector operations and vector uh, variables. In the if dot case, we're going to take, uh, we're going to evaluate the first and second arguments. So we're going to get back v1 from the first subtree and v2 from the second subtree. Take the dot product of those, and if the dot product is greater than or equal to zero, we're going to return the third vector up through if dot. If the dot product is negative, then we return the vector that's returned by the fourth subtree. So you can imagine uh, by evolving populations of these different kinds uh, of trees, we can get more, or less, uh, more and more sophisticated behavior. The question is, is this still, uh, is, there, is there a possible set of vector operations and variables that allow uh, the lions to successfully capture the gazelle? So we'll see that in a moment when we look at the results. Uh, we can also ask if it was a single lion, what is the what is the best strategy here you can imagine? So uh, just to digest sort of the intuition behind this, have a look at the three vector variables that are avail available and the vector uh, operators. Can you imagine constructing a tree uh, that might uh, and uh, that might allow a single lion to capture the gazelle? Uh, as you can imagine, since we're dealing with four lions rather than one, it's very difficult to imagine a tree that will allow the lion to capture the, the gazelle. An obvious thing might, for a lion to do might be uh, to create a tree with just a single node, gazelle, in which case the lion will just chase after the gazelle. But remember that the gazelle travels, uh, travels three units per turn, where the lions only travel one unit per turn. So that's not going to be very successful for a single lion. Okay. Let's move on for a moment. Um, we're going to actually look at a, a, a number of experiments, a number of results. Um, in the second experiment, they're going to add to the genetic programming algorithm four additional vector variables. So we've got three here. In the second experiment, we're going to add a fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh vari uh, vector variable. These are known as allowing the, the robot to have dyictic sensing. And we'll talk about what dyictic sensing is uh, in a moment. <laughs> Good question. Do the ghosts from Pac-Man count as swarm robots? They each have different behaviors, but the same goal. Uh, absolutely. So the, uh, the, the ghosts are working as a, as a group to try and capture Pac-Man. From the point of view of the ghosts, it doesn't really matter which one captures Pac-Man as long as, as one of them do. Actually, that's, that's a good way to think about this. You could imagine uh, altering or adapting the, the vector variables and operators here for the ghosts for Pac-Man, and you've got more or less the same situation as we do here. Good, good question. 
Okay, so in the second experiment, we're gonna basically make the lions a little bit more powerful, and by powerful we mean we're gonna allow them to diictically sense their neighbors. Diictic means relative to oneself. So you'll notice that we've added a fourth vector variable here, which if this is in is in a tree, it will return a vector that connects the lion, that connects the closest lion in the pack of four to the gazelle. There is a vector that connects the current lion to its nearest neighbor lion. Um, and then also our lion, which means if we have one lion that is heading towards the, if I'm a lion and I'm heading towards the camera, I start sweeping in a clockwise sweep to my right, so diictic sensing relative to self. I start moving in a, count, a clockwise sweep, and the first lion that I see on my right during this sweep, I connect myself to that lion with a vector, and that vector is returned. Uh, I, apparently some of you cannot hear me, but it seems that some of you uh, can, so just make sure that you've unmuted your computer audio and that you've also unmuted uh, the microphone that's inside, uh, that's inside the uh, inside the Twitch stream. Uh, ref uh, please refresh your page if you can't uh, can't hear me. Okay, um, sorry, so we're just diactic sensing. So right lion, and then there's also L lion, which is the vector that connects myself if I'm the lion to, uh, connects the lion to, if I'm the lion connects, uh, I, I send out a vector in the direction that I'm heading, and then I start a counterclockwise sweep, and the first lion that I see on my left, I connect a vector from myself to that lion and that vector is returned in a tree that contains the L lion node. So far, so good? Okay. I think we've resolved the audio issues as well. Okay, so that's diectic sensing. So they, we can then ask the question, if we, if we run genetic programming, where genetic programming is evolving populations of trees like this, and drop these trees into the lions, how well do they do at capturing the gazelle? versus evolving trees that contain these vector variables and operators plus these four additional vector variables. Do the lions do a better job in this case? Can you imagine a, a, a pack of four lions using diectic sensing? What might be a good strategy, generally speaking, for lions that can diectically sense one another to capture the gazelle? Any ideas? Exactly. So one of the, the worst things you can do if you're hunting in a pack is for everyone to stay together. So if I detect a lion on my right, I might take the dot product of that or the inverse of that and head in the opposite direction. If there's a lion on my left, I will try and move away from the lion on my left, not unlike the Boyd algorithm that we saw last time. So a good general rule of thumb if you're working collectively is to spread out and cover, cover the field or in this case cover the, the toroid. Um, you might be able to move around the gazelle and uh, fence it in. Exactly. So you can imagine that diectic sensing might be useful. We're going to look at a third experiment where they took the base set of vector variables and vector operators and added these four uh, sense organs for the robot, if you like, or, or sensing strategies, which are name-based sensing. So if I am Lion1, and I am running a, a control tree here, a tree that controls my behavior, and somewhere in that tree is a node called Lion1. That's the vector that connects the current lion, Lion1, to Lion1, which is myself, so the zero vector. If I am Lion1 and I contain a, a behavior tree that contains the node Lion2, then that node will return a, a vector that connects me, Lion1, with vector uh, with lion two and vice versa. So in essence, you can imagine the lions moving around on the toroid, and they can sense the vector that connects them to a particular lion in the pride, like lion three, lion four, lion two, 
uh, and so on. So if, again, you were a member of a lion pride with these sensing abilities, what might be a good strategy in this case? What is the advantage of name-based sensing over deictic sensing or lack of either kind of, of sensing? For those of you that have ever been involved in team sports, there's a lot of strategies that involve name-based sensing. Uh, each lion should have a node for the other lions to know their positions. Exactly. So if I'm lion one, I will probably be able to do better in terms of helping my fellow lions or possibly capturing the gazelle myself if I contain in my control tree nodes lion two, lion three, lion four. Now how I combine that information together using the vector operator is not obvious, but at least I should coordinate my action as Lion 1 according to what Lion 2, 3, and 4 are doing. Uh, there's a semi-related question here. If the lions were not identical, meaning they had different speed and stamina, might name-based sensing be more useful than deictic sensing? That is an excellent question. So, of course, the situations in which one type of sensing is advantageous over another depends on a lot of different factors, and one of them might be assuming that particular lions have particular uh, abilities. Okay. In this particular experiment, they did not look at lions with differing physical abilities. Uh, a simplified version of this could, uh, could make for a good final project. Might be a little bit late to change the idea for your final project now, but that's, that's a great question and it would be interesting to test that uh, in an evolutionary robotics experiment. Okay, so just keep in mind for the moment we have these three different kinds of experiments evolving behaviors for robots using this set, using this set, and using this set. We're going to add another wrinkle, which is how do we actually uh, take these behavior trees, which are uh, uh, cartoonified here with these three node, two arrow uh, cartoons. Um, the simplest thing we could do is if we have a population of evolving trees in GP, we take one tree in the population, pull it out of the population, make four clones, identical copies of each of those trees, and drop them into the four lions. This is exactly what happens in the Boyd's algorithm. Every member of the pride is running exactly the same behavior tree. That does not mean that they all do exactly the same thing because they're all gonna have different initial positions and headings and they're gonna have different relative orientations to each other and to the gazelle. We could do something else, which is uh, the uh, investigators refer to as free breeding, which is we have a population of uh, we have a population of trees that we're evolving. Each tree has is forced to have four subtrees, and each four subtree each of the four subtrees has a root node called L1, L2, L3, or L4. And as you can imagine, all the nodes. Uh, all the nodes below at the L1 root node dictate the behavior for L1. All of the nodes below the L2 root node dictate the behavior of Lion 2, uh, and so on. So in this cartoon here, we're seeing three trees in the GP population that evolve, that uh, encode behavior for three different Lion prides. Assuming that these three prides did relatively well at bringing down their three respective gazelles, they might survive in the population. Uh, less well-behaving prides in the population die out, and these three trees are selected for sexual recombination. This might seem a little odd because we have three parents here rather than two parents. But in this example here, we're going to create a fourth new pride by again creating an empty tree that has four empty subtrees. We're going to randomly select one of the subtrees from the three parents. In this case, we randomly select L2 from the third parent uh, and copy it into 
uh, L1 in the new child and maybe introduce a mutation to this tree. So maybe we alter some of these nodes or uh, add or remove parts uh, of the tree to produce L1. We then need to create L2, so we randomly select another subtree from among the three parents. In this case, we chose L1 from parent one. We make a, a copy of L1. We introduce some modifications to the copied uh, subtree, add, remove, or delete parts of the tree, and plug it in as L1, and repeat that process for L3 and L4, and that gives us a new set of behaviors for a new pride. The uh, investigators looked at a third way of producing a new lion pride, which they called uh, restricted breeding, and what they did here is when they were building uh, L1 in the child, they were only allowed to select L1 from the parents. So in this case, parent one was selected. So L1 is copied and mutated to produce the child L1. To produce the child L2, they uh, flipped a coin and chose this parent. They randomly, they copied and then randomly modified L2 and plugged it in uh, and so on. So we call this restricted breeding, meaning that the LI, or the ith subtree in a child pride is a randomly modified copy of the ith subtree from one of the parents. Make sense? Okay, so we have three different ways of taking a genotype, which is a tree or a set of trees uh, in the population, and creating a new genotype for a new phenotype for a new pride of lions. Three different ways of breeding and three different kinds of lion prides. This, this, and this, that gives us a total of uh, nine different experiments. So they actually performed 1,200 evolutionary runs. So uh, for each of the three sensing capabilities and for each of the three team construction methods, uh, they did 100 runs of each of the nine combinations, three breeding, three team construction methods, three sensing capabilities. It gives us nine possibilities. So they did 100 runs for each of those nine possibilities, giving us a total of 900 runs. And they then looked at uh, three additional control cases. So control cases are where they knock out some part of the experiment. And if the control case does worse, then the experimental treatments, which are these nine experiments up here, we know that the part that was knocked out in the control experiment was important. So first thing they looked at is they did 100 runs where they just evolved behavior for one lion. Um, as you can imagine, it doesn't do very well. They did 100 runs of no evolution at all, just one randomly moving lion, and 100 runs of four randomly moving lions. So for each one of these 1,200 uh, runs, uh, each run was executed for 51 generations. They had a population size of 500, meaning there were 500 trees encoding behaviors for 500 different lion prides. Each tree could grow to be a maximum size of 70 and a maximum depth uh, of 17. And each new tree was created by crossing over, as we just saw, genetically recombining material from parents into a child. And uh, every once in a while, a mutation was introduced. So some, uh, some, part, of, some part of the tree, a node was deleted, added, or uh, the material inside the node was changed to something else. Okay, so um, they then had to take each of the 500 prides in each generation and evaluate its fitness. What is the fitness of a pride? Well, you can probably imagine they took the gazelle and the four lions, placed them at random positions and random headings on the toroid. They then allowed each gazelle and the four lions to move 15 times each. At the end of those 15 time steps, they computed the fitness of the pride. If there was a lion that was uh, less than or equal to one unit from the gazelle, they, they considered that a successful capture of the gazelle by the lion, and they assigned a fitness of zero. Otherwise, um, the fitness was the distance between the nearest lion to the gazelle uh, 
uh, minus one. Remember that we're only evaluating this else clause if the nearest lion is greater than one unit away from the gazelle. So basically the higher the number, the worse the pride did. So uh, fitness is probably not the best term here. You can think of this as, as error, or maybe they should have inverted this. So usually a higher fitness value is better. In this case, a lower fitness value is better. Okay, so a lot of information. I'll just pause here for a minute. Um, if anybody has any questions before we look at actual results, please feel free to, to ask your question in chat. While we're waiting, something to think about is which of these nine combinations do you think is going to produce the most successful pride? Those with basic sensing, dialectic sensing, or name-based sensing, and those produced by cloning, free breeding, or restricted breeding. Uh, is the there's a question in chat? Uh, is the fitness calculated for the group or for a single lion? That is a very good question. Everything in this experiment is done at the level of the pride, not at the level of the individual lion. So you'll notice in the fitness function here it says distance from the nearest lion to the gazelle. So we always have four lions, and those four lions share to some degree genetic material. So it doesn't matter which of the four lions happens to be the nearest lion. That's the fitness, and that fitness value is assigned to the entire tree. And remember that a single tree, regardless of which of these three breeding programs we're using, a, sing a, a, a tree, a single tree, like this one, this one, or this one, encodes behaviors for all four lions. So we're computing the fitness of the pride, not the fitness of any single lion. It's a good question. So if I'm a member of the pride and I'm very far from the gazelle, when one of my pride mates captures the gazelle, I get just as much fitness as my fellow pride member that actually captured the gazelle. Okay, uh, why do they use a tree for the genetic programming in this uh, problem? That is a good question. Uh, there could be other ways to uh, encode behaviors for the lions. As we've seen in most of the experiments, we could have used uh, a neural network. Uh, in this case, the two authors, Luke and Spector, uh, are very well known for uh, advanced uh, they're very well-known genetic programming researchers, so as you'll often see uh, in research, researchers tend to use the tools that they're most familiar with. So in this case, it's genetic programming. Um, it could be, it would be an interesting experiment to redo this experiment, but instead of using genetic programming, use neural networks to control the behavior uh, of the pride of lions. Yeah, good question. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, let's go in and look at some actual results now. Um, unfortunately, again, this is an older experiment. We don't have any videos of lions moving uh, and capturing gazelles. Uh, the results are summarized in the table that you see uh, here. You'll notice uh, we have our three ways in which the pride can sense uh, uh, the other lions and the gazelle. We have our three sensing abilities and our three breeding programs along uh, the top here, giving us a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine experiments, plus the one, two, three controls. So we have a total of 12 experiments reported here. For each experiment, we're, comp we're reporting the average fitness and the fitness of the best pride ever evolved using that, uh, using that experimental setting. Okay, let's start by looking at the control results. So here we have one evolved lion. On average, that lion uh, at the end of the 15 time steps is 7.39 units away from the gazelle, and the best evolved lion ever got, uh, the closest it ever got to a gazelle was 5.39. 
we compare that number to one randomly moving uh, one randomly moving lion, you'll notice that there's not much of a difference, 7.3, 7.8. So it almost doesn't really even help to evolve the behavior of a single lion compared to just one randomly moving lion. Might help a little bit, but not not very much. The minute we field uh, we place onto the toroid four lions, even if they're moving randomly, the average distance between any one of those four is much closer to the gazelle at the end than any one randomly moving lion. And that should probably make sense to you because even though the four lions are moving randomly, um, that means they're going to, just by random movement, they're going to spread out along the uh, toroid and it's going to be harder for the gazelle to maintain maximum distance away from those four uh, lions. So far so good? Okay. Let's, uh, we just said this, so four lions do better than one uh, lion. Um, let's now go up and have a look at this set of nine experiments, and let's start with the clones, which is the simplest, uh, is the simplest set, the simplest way to take a tree and use it to control the behavior of the lion. So every lion pride is running exactly the same tree, and you'll notice that on average, uh, the cloned uh, evolved pride um, does much better than four randomly moving uh, lions. So. There definitely is an advantage to evolving behaviors for four lions. Um, you'll notice in the clone case, however, name-based sensing was worse than deictic sensing. So here's name-based sensing. On average, the lions got 1.9 units away. Um, but when we use deictic sensing, they, the cloned lions got closer, 1.5. You might think that name-based sensing name-based sensing where the lions can actually detect their relative uh, distance and uh, their relative position from the other named lions would help. But it doesn't in this case. It makes things actually worse. Uh, any idea uh, why? Uh, professor, there's an ad. Ah, yes, I'm sorry. If you refresh the stream, you might see an ad for a few seconds. I apologize about that. Why might uh, name-based sensing be worse than deictic sensing when all of the lions are running exactly the same program? Any ideas? Why is it harder for the lions to coordinate their action when they're all running exactly the same program and they're looking at specific lions in the pride? Okay, um, maybe the difference between deictic and name-based sensing isn't immediately clear. Let's let's back up a moment. So in deictic sensing, we have each of the four lions. They're moving around the toroid, and they're basing their movement based on uh, where the other lions are relative to themselves. So if I am lion one, I might be basing my action on the lion that's on my right, and lion two, who's on my right, may be basing their action based on the lion that's on their right. Everything is relative to the lion itself. In the case of name-based sensing, if I'm lion one, I am basing the way in which I move based on, for example, lion three. And lion two, another lion in the pride, who's, who's a clone of me, is running exactly the same program, is also basing its behavior on also on lion three. So I am basing my behavior, I'm lion one, on lion three. Lion two is also basing its behavior on lion three. Lion three is basing its behavior on lion three, and same thing for uh, lion four. So Mark says um, perhaps uh, for clones, perhaps the reason that name-based sensing was worse is because they all have exactly the same skills. So they're all doing exact, they're all running exactly the same behavioral program. Uh, Daniel says it's difficult to distinguish from each other. Exactly. So if we're all running the same program and we're all basing our behavior on, for example, Lion 3, 
that probably doesn't make much sense, right? But if we're all running the same program and we're all basing our behavior on the lion that's to our right, the lion that's to our right is going to be a different lion for different lions in the pride, and that's probably a more successful hunting strategy. Let's go to restricted breeding now, and you'll notice that the situation here is the opposite. Now, name-based sensing for restricted breeding is doing better than dialectic sensing. So if you're in the restricted breeding program, which is where if I'm lion one, my behavior is some randomly modified copy of lion one from some parent pride, Name-based sensing is now more useful than dialectic sensing in the restricted breeding case, which is the opposite of what it was in the clones. Why is that the case? <laughs> also, we all know uh, clone troopers are not good at doing their job. Yes, I think that's a Star Wars reference. Exactly. It's not usually not a good thing for everyone to be doing exactly the same thing. So in restricted breeding, lion one may be doing something very different from lion four because they each are running a different behavioral program. There's a whole tree underneath L1 here and a different tree under L4 here. And that tree under L1 is some randomly modified copy of the tree that was under L1 in the parent pride. So why does that restricted breeding program combined with name-based sensing produce, in fact, the best pride of all? If you compare this number against the other eight averages, you'll notice it's the lower. So the best combination here is name-based sensing combined with restricted breeding. Why? Why does that lead to the most successful pride? This is the most important point in this, in this experiment, so we're going to spend some time thinking about this. It produces more unique individuals in the population. Exactly. So if I'm lion one and my behavioral tree is the result of uh, lion one from a parent clone, uh, from a parent pride, that L1 is a randomly modified copy from a grand parental pride and all the way back, perhaps this L1 program is getting better and better at basing the L1 strategy on what L2 is doing. Same thing with L2. Perhaps L2 is evolving over time to get better and better at responding to what L1 and L3 are doing. So you can imagine more and more unique or specialized behavior in each of the four lions. Right? Perhaps uh, in, in a hypothetical situation, the pride quote unquote decides that L3 is going to be the lion that chases the gazelle, and lions one, two, and four are going to watch where L3 is and watch where the gazelle is and go behind the gazelle. So uh, in hunting, group hunting, there's a, a strategy called flushing, which is you have a bunch of human hunters or animal hunters that get the prey species. They surround it and gradually move towards the prey, causing the prey to move in one particular direction, which is into a trap, which in this case might be the strategy of L3. So L1, 2, and 4... L1, 2, and 4 may evolve to get better and better at sensing where L3 is, where G is, and to get behind G relative to L3, and get better and better at slowly moving the gazelle towards uh, L3, and L3 might get better at getting away from 1, 2, and 4, and G and getting uh, in the opposite way, and that they can both, uh, both the two subgroups can converge on the gazelle, for example. So what name-based sensing combined with restricted breeding does is allow increasing specialization. One of the reasons why groups of robots or animals are, or humans often do better than any one animal, robot, or human is because of specialization. 
Uh, as uh, as Daniel was mentioning, if everyone does exactly the same thing, sometimes that's useful, but sometimes it's better for one or a few individuals to specialize and do one thing and a few individuals to do something else. Uh, Mark says it's kind of like practicing a team sport as a team. The more you practice together, the better you get. So absolutely, so that's the evolution part. These prides are evolving to get better and better at what they do. But in a lot of team sports, uh, any individual member of the team does not do every job. They have specialized roles. You have the goalie that never leaves the goal or the uh, offensive member who is always pushing against the enemy and the defense that is always staying back towards uh, the goal. You can, you can see in a lot of team sports why, why it makes sense for certain individuals to specialize for certain roles. The lions in this case are able to specialize because they can not only sense other members of the pride, so if I am L1, I can not only sense L2, but I can also sense over time how L2 is moving, and based on how L2 moves, that obviously alters the, ve the vector that connects L1, myself, to L2 and is going to modify my behavior. So in a way, L2 is not just moving in order to capture the gazelle, but might be trying to telegraph or advertise to me what I should be doing, or perhaps what L2 is about to do. So we looked at three different sensing strategies, none, diictic, and name-based. What might be an additional thing that you would enable the lions to do to coordinate their behavior even better and specialize even better. What other abilities might these lions need beyond just name-based sensing to sense where their neighbors are relative to themselves to make them better group hunters? Any ideas? So in this example here, and in the real Serengeti, uh, the uh, lions and lion prides are uh, often the apex predator. Um, but uh, about half a million years ago, there was another apex predator that came along and actually started to prey on uh, lions, on the apex predator. Uh, this particular species also coordinated its, its action um, and became very, very successful at bringing down uh, lions, even though this particular species had uh, smaller claws. The species is smaller and weaker than a lion. Uh, it's humans, right? So what is it about human gr group hunting that, is, that had an advantage over lion group, uh, group, uh, group hunting? Our ancestors, who are smaller and weaker and have uh, less effective claws than lions, became very successful at hunting lions. Why? What is it that we had beyond what lions had? Communication. Exactly. So, if I am if I am uh, if I am a, a hunter, a human hunter out on the Serengeti Plain, and I can see one of my human colleagues off in the distance. Um, I can see that individual, but that individual might start to start to signal or give uh, uh, hand signals to tell me what he or she is planning to do next, and then I may alter my behavior based on that. So um, as we start to try and evolve machines in ever larger groups that coordinate their actions in more sophisticated ways and perhaps specialize uh, to a greater and greater degree, they're going to need communication to do so. But where does communication come from? So what is sort of the origins of communication and how might it evolve from a population that has no ability to communicate? That is what we're going to look at in uh, the next lecture on the evolution of communication. So in this lecture, what we're going to see is we're going to start with a population of robots that are not able to communicate, but they will evolve the ability to uh, communicate increasingly sophisticated information. Okay. 
So this is a relatively interesting uh, experiment. This is the first experiment we've seen in which the robots have sexes. So in this experiment, we're going to look at a population of 1,600 robots, 800 female robots and 800 male robots. Um, we're going to use a very simple simulation, uh, simulated environment like we just saw with the, the toroid. In this case, we're going to be dealing with a grid world. So we're going to take a toroid and cut it into 200 by 200 squares. So imagine a sheet that has 40,000 uh, squares in it. We roll that sheet into toroid like we did before. We take those 40,000 empty cells and we sprinkle 1,600 robots into those empty cells with the rule that uh, no cell can contain more than one uh, robot. So we've got 1,600 robots sprinkled over this 40,000 square uh, toroid. The females and males in this experiment are going to have different sensing and acting abilities. The females are deaf. The moment you hear that, you know that there is audio in this uh, simulation. The females are deaf and immobile. They cannot move, but they can signal, so they can emit a signal. Males are blind. They cannot see other males or other females. They're blind, uh, but they can hear signals emitted by females. They cannot signal themselves but they're mobile. So you can see that they, in the cartoon on the left here, uh, the M's have little arrows associated with them, and the M's are pointing uh, upside down or to the left or to the right, so they can have four different orientations and move uh, from one cell to the next. Okay. Um, what you see on the left now are the neural network controllers and the top left these are female controllers and the bottom left are the male uh, controllers. Let's talk about the female network first. You'll notice that the female network has a, a, an input layer here. This input layer, uh, in, this input layer detects the position and orientation of the closest male in her visual range. So let me back up for a moment. Uh, each female uh, can uh, can see, and she can see two units away from herself. So there's a total of five by five or 25 cells, which are basically uh, her range. If any male enters her territory, she can sense the relative position of that male to herself, dialectic sensing. So in this case, for this female here, she detects a male that is southwest of herself, and that male is facing west. This female up here senses a male to her southeast, uh, and that male is facing uh, south. So that information uh, is fed into the input layer of the female network. If there are no males in the female's uh, range of vision, all of the input neurons are zero. Uh, since there are four, uh, uh, sorry, eight cardinal directions, north, south, west, east, northwest, northeast, southwest, and southeast, we have those eight directions. And for each of those eight directions, there are four potential orientations. The male is facing north, west, east, or south. So if you take each of those eight, uh, each of those eight directions and multiply them by four, you get a total of 32 uh, input neurons to the female. So for any one of those 32, uh, any any one of those 32 input neurons, it's either zero or one. Zero means there is no male in that direction, facing in that direction. A one indicates there is a male in that direction facing in that direction. Um, however, at any point in time, this binary input vector to a given female is only going to have a maximum of uh, one, one value. So going back to this cartoon for a moment, you'll see that this female actually has a male to, its, to her southwest and also to her northwest but the first male is closer to her than the second male, so it is only this male that is going to register on her input layer. So of the 32 input neurons, the one that corresponds to male in the southwest and facing west, that bit is set to 1, and the remaining 31 bits are set to 0. So far, so good.
Okay, so in the female network, we have a th we have 32 binary input neurons. We feed them through to a hidden uh, unit. We can see there are recurrent connections, which is a reminder here that recurrent connections mean that females can remember things. In this case, they can remember where males were and which direction they were facing at the previous time step. The hidden, uh, the hidden layer feeds into an output layer, which is also a binary vector. And remember that females do not move, so the, the numbers arriving at the output layer don't, uh, don't start up motors which cause the female to move. Instead, that is the female's song. So uh, depending on how many output neurons there are, and there's going to be different numbers of output neurons in different experiments, we're going to use a particular activation function, which is the step function. Uh, remember that neurons have activation functions which uh, squash the raw input value arriving, uh, the raw, uh, the, sorry, the, the weighted sum arriving at the neuron and in this case we're going to use a step function which is that the uh, actual value or the activated uh, value of the neuron is going to be either 0 or 1. So by using the step function, um, by placing the step function as the activation function in all of the output neurons we can ensure that all the output neurons are going to be binary, 0 or 1. Okay. If there is a male that is inside the female's territory, the female will emit a song, and that song will be heard by the male. So if we switch to the male network now, the input layer for the male is also a binary uh, vector. It is not a 32-bit binary vector like for the female. It is the, the binary, the input uh, the number of input neurons for the male matches the number of output neurons for the female. And we simply copy the song from the female into the input layer of the male. And that means that in this simulation that the male hears the female's song. So going back to this cartoon example here, we have one female and there are two males in her uh, sensing range. The female senses the closest male. She emits a particular song and all of the males that are in her range hear that song. So in this case, this male hears her song and in this case, this male hears her song. This male and this male that are outside her range do not hear uh, her song. You'll notice in this example here, there is one male that is in both is in two female territories. So uh, this female is emitting a song only in res in response to the only male in her territory. This male, this male is of equal distance from these two females. So this male will flip a coin. Heads, it hears this song. Tails, it hears that song. Um, if a male is in two female territories and it is closer to one female than another, then it will only hear the song of the closer of the two females. So far so good. Any questions? No? Okay. So in the male network, you can see like the female network, there is also a hidden layer, also with recurrent connections. So males can also remember things from their past which in this case is remembrance of songs past. So if their females may change their songs, and you can think for yourself what causes a female to change her song, and males can remember that previous song and register the change in the song. The output layer, uh, the output layer for the males has four output neurons and they, uh, they do not squash the function. Uh, they just leave the raw input as is. And it may be difficult to see in the stream here. In this case, they're just showing the raw input, as, uh, raw output, summed uh, input as, um, as integers, minus 4, 22, 78. At every time step of the simulation for each male, we look at each of the four values arriving at the four output neurons and find which is the maximal value. And the maximal value is going to indicate which of these four actions the male performs at that time step. So if the first of the four output neurons is maximal, 
the robot will stay still. If the second of the four output neurons has the highest value, the, the male will move forward, uh, and so on. Any questions about male and female uh, network controllers? Okay, so uh, how does the simulation work? Well, remember that we have 800 males and 800 uh, females. Uh, there's a question. Fa females can see, they just can't move. Yes, that's correct. Right? They, the females are sessile, meaning they do not move because their output neurons, uh, their output neurons dictate a song, not movement. But the male output neurons dictate movement. Okay. Remember that we have 800 males and 800 females. The males are moving. If at any time a male moves into the same uh, cell as a female, they mate. Um, they make a modified copy of each. So uh, we have M prime and F prime, which is the male and female uh, offsprings. It's a little confusing here because ironically, even though the uh, robot have sexes, they don't have sex, because we're not going to combine genetic material between these two networks, because these two networks are different. So when a male occupies the same cell as a female, we make a randomly modified copy of the male parent's network, and that becomes M prime, the, the son. We make a randomly modified copy of the female network, and that becomes the daughter. We then randomly select one other male and one other female somewhere, somewhere else on the toroid. We delete that female and we replace it with the daughter network, shown by this arrow here. In this case, this male was randomly selected. We delete this male and we replace it with the son network. So the two children have displaced one other male and one other female from the board. So we still have 800 males and 800 uh, females. We take the uh, male parent and the female parent that are still cohabitating the same cell, and we move them apart. We put the male somewhere else, somewhere on the grid, and we move the female somewhere else uh, on the grid. Remember that the females can't move, so you can think of this as like a puff of wind or something else that's randomly perturbed the positions of the mating parents. Otherwise, they would stay in the cell and continue to produce uh, offspring. Okay, so um, that, is how, uh, that is how reproduction happens in this experiment. The repercussions of that is that we now have an evolutionary algorithm that looks very different from any evolutionary algorithm we've seen so far. There is still a population, 800 males, 800 females. We start our evolutionary algorithm with 800 random female networks and 800 random male networks. So we have randomly moving or at least randomly behaving males and females, but once any two of them come into contact with one another, they start to produce randomly modified copies. So we have mutation like we've seen before, a reproduction and, and mutation. But there are no generations anymore. We are not deleting the low, the uh, low fit, low fit individuals and making making randomly modified copies of those that survive. We simply make randomly modified copies of males and females that cohabitate, that find each other. So what is the fitness function here? We also are not writing down a fitness function. We're not going to see an equation for fitness here. What is fitness? in this evolution of communication experiment. What makes for a good female and what makes for a good male? Males that can find females quickly, exactly. So a male that never moves, that never leaves its own cell, is never by definition going to find a female, because females don't move. Females will not come to the males. Males have to find the females. That male is going to eventually be overwritten by the son of another male that found a female. So that's, uh, that describes males. Um, number of times you have reproduced. Yes, yeah, exactly, but we want to try and be more specific. 
Uh, as mentioned, we want males to, uh, as morning hours mentions here, males should move quickly so as not to be randomly deleted when somebody else finds a female, correct? So that's, that's we're, we're describing the fitness of males, males that can move quickly and find females. What is the fitness of a female? What is good female behavior in this experiment? It's not quite as obvious as for the males. Accurate signaling or uh, giving calls that accurately direct males to their position. Exactly. So uh, I think that's the most accurate, uh, the accurate description here is uh, a good mating call and a good mating call requires that it directs a male to the female's position. But if you think about it, that's very difficult because it requires the female to send the right signal that is interpreted correctly by a male. So there's sort of two things that need to be overcome in the evolution of communication, which is the evolution of the signaler, which in this case is the female, she has to evolve a particular kind of song, and the evolution of the signalee, which is the agent that receives the signal, which in this case is the males, and they both have to interpret or under, quote unquote understand that signal appropriately. So is that possible in the simple example? Let's have a look. Okay, um, like the previous experiment, we're going to see results in table form. So uh, what we're going to do in this example is assume that signals are three digits long, and I'm just gonna back up for a moment to the networks. Remember that the output layer for the female is the song. So in this case, the female output layer contains three output neurons, and the male's input layer contains three input neurons. Since songs are binary, or each bit in a song is binary, there are eight possible songs that a female can emit. So we can create eight rows here, and for every, uh, for ev across these um, 1600 agents, we can detect every time a female emits one of these songs and what the male in her signaling range does in response. And as you can see here, um, at the very beginning of the experiment, after 100 time steps have occurred, and what is, what is a time step? So if we go back here, a time step is uh, allowing uh, is allowing the males to move and the females to signal. Uh, on average, what is we can see that the, the, uh, at this point the males are basically acting randomly. So 25% of the time they're moving forward. On average, 25% of the time they're turning right, 25% turning left, and 25% of the time standing still. This is what you would expect at the very beginning of the evolutionary process. Where no behavior at all has evolved yet. What do you think we're going to see when we advance to the next slide? So in the next slide, we're going to see again eight rows corresponding to these eight songs. And we're going to fast forward a little bit in the evolutionary process. How do you expect the numbers for the males to change? What do you expect uh, the males to mostly be doing once evolution starts to occur? Any ideas? If you were a male living in this simulated world and um, there was no language yet, females had not evolved the ability to sing and males had not evolved the ability to understand songs yet, what is your best course of action? What's the best thing for you to do? Standing still is the worst thing to do. So you can imagine that this row in, or this column is going to go quickly to zero. Males would move towards any sound, yeah, possibly. Um, maybe they just sort of move randomly in these three columns, so they evolve the ability to at least not to stand still. Certain songs would now attribute directions, possibly. But there's an intermediate step before language has actually evolved at all, which is this. 
Obviously, males that stood still when extinct, as 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 someone guessed here, uh, as Nordic man guessed. Um, a few males are still turning right and turning left, but the vast majority of males, on average, are moving forward. So regardless of what song the female admit, uh, emits, the males are ignoring that song or they're ignoring what the females are saying and just blindly moving forward. You can, uh, you can come up with your analogies to human males and human females in this situation. Uh, we will leave those jokes aside for, for today. Okay, what happens after this? So moving forward, moving blindly forward is generally speaking a good thing to do if you're illiterate, meaning you don't understand any signals yet. Even turning right or turning left is one precious time step that's been wasted. If you turn left or turn right, you're just changing your orientation inside the same cell and you're guaranteed not to mate at the next time step. Okay. Uh, after after uh, 7,500 time steps in the simulated world, we can see that we have we still have illiterate males. They're basically all moving forward now, regardless of what females do. You can now ask the question: In this world, is there an advantage to a robot? Uh, is there an advantage to a male robot that responds appropriately to a given song? And the answer, as you can imagine, is yes. If you move forward, you're still uh, likely to encounter a female, but it's still a rare event. We have 40,000 uh, we have 40,000 total cells on the toroid, and only 1,600 uh, so only 800 females. So most, the vast majority of the cells are empty. Right? You're, you're, the males are exploring a vast space, and females are few and far between in this space. It would be good if when a male gets close to a female, even if it doesn't actually run into the female, if the male is able to move and find the female. So after 15,000 time steps in this simulation, you can see now that the, not all males are moving forward all of the time. 77% of the time, the males turn right when they enter a female territory and they hear the song 101. 93% of the time when males enter a female territory and that female emits the song 110, the males will turn left. So there's a lot of turning left and turning right. And remember that these are uh, expensive actions in the sense of the males are burning one time step in which they're guaranteed not to find and mate with the female. But you can tell even just from this very simple uh, figure that 101 and 110 now mean something. So I'm going to put quotes around mean because we are moving now from communication into language, something that we've only touched on so far a little bit. And meaning in language can be very controversial because the word meaning can mean very different things to different people. In this simple experiment, it has the advantage where meaning is very clear. What 101 means is that males should turn right, and 110 means turn left. Um, morning hours ask the question, does turning take the place of moving? So when you turn, you stay in the same square. Yes, exactly. So if we go back to the male neural network for a moment, there are four neurons, and only one of these four neurons can be active at any one time, which is turn left or turn right. And I, I, I'm sorry, I should say turn left on the spot and turn right on the spot. Okay, so this is what we have at this point in time. Let's have a look at what this actually looks like. So um, when we, we can see what the males do when they hear these two songs, 101 and 110, but when? When do females emit this song? It turns out that they will only emit that song when males enter into the four cardinal directions. So when there's a male directly to the north of the female, directly to the east, to the south, or to the west. Um, so, for example, imagine that we have a male that is moving um, southwest to the female and enters the female's territory and is now southwest of the female. 
The female does not want to emit turn left or turn right at this time. She wants to admit, admit, uh, emit one of the other six songs, which to the males mean go straight. So the male, for example, is sitting here. It hears one of those six other songs, moves forward, and is now uh, occupying this cell, moves forward, and is now occupying this cell, is, and is directly to the south of the female. Remember that females can see, so she sees that there is a male directly to the south. What song does she admit? What song does she emit when the male is moving east but is directly to the south of her? Which of these eight songs does she emit? You can just type the song directly into chat. The male is south of the female and is moving to the east. The female emits the song 101, which means uh, turn right. So if that's true, the male is down here and will turn to the right and now be facing south. What song does the female want to emit at this time? Turn left, which is which song? Exactly. So at this point, a female will emit 110 at this point. The male will turn to the north. And now there is a male to the south of the female pointing to the north. Uh, we've run out of time. I want you to think about which of the eight songs the female should emit at that time. We will revisit that on Thursday. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. And uh, I will see you uh, Thursday morning. Uh, thanks for attending this morning and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Left, which is which.